Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Russell Barkley and I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center here in Richmond, Virginia in the United States. In this lecture, I'm going to speak with you about a variety of evidence-based management methods that we use in attempting to manage ADHD children within the school, specifically the classroom settings. There are numerous such techniques that educators can use to help these children and teenagers in school. The purpose of this lecture is not to encourage you to use all of these various methods. That's not the point. This is more like going into a store or into a restaurant where you survey the menu that's available and then you select the most appropriate method uh, or in that case food off the menu that you want. But in this case the menu I'm going to show you has a variety of tactics or techniques that we have found to be useful in various scientific studies on ADHD children including in schools and classrooms that I have designed to work with ADHD children, as well as schools that specialize in working with ADHD children in parts of the United States. So let's begin, first of all, with an important qualification or caveat. I am an expert in ADHD, particularly in the role of executive functioning and self-regulation in the disorder. You are the expert on educating children, particularly the children within your school and classroom and the various settings and contexts. There is no way that I can know specifically your classroom or the nature of the students within it. But together, as experts, we can combine our expertise in order to tailor programs that are specific to the children that you're trying to help. So I will bring the general expertise about science and the various methods that have proven useful, and you bring your expertise about your school, classroom, and the particular children that you have in mind. Together we should be able to successfully manage and improve the functioning of children with ADHD within your school. I want to start with what I call my touchstone principles. These are the general principles that I think teachers need to consider when deciding how to help a child or a teen with ADHD. They come from my theory of ADHD as a disorder of executive functioning. I have a separate lecture on that topic that I encourage you to review. But basically, the executive functions are those psychological abilities that are granted to us by the brain's frontal lobe primarily and its networks back into other regions of the brain. There are seven mental abilities we believe that are located here and that interact to allow people to control their own behavior, to self-regulate over time toward their goals, toward assignments, tasks, and deadlines. In other words, toward the future. So that the frontal lobe is about binding events across time in order to accomplish goals and achieve an improvement in our success or welfare over what we would have done had we just acted on the moment. Now, these executive functions lead to a variety of principles about management. You will not find these principles coming from any other theory of ADHD, but these are incredibly helpful ideas in guiding you on what we need to do to help these children with their executive and self-regulatory deficits. The first of these is to recognize that ADHD is not an attention disorder, but it is a disorder of self-regulation. And since self-regulation arises from the brain's executive abilities, that means that ADHD is an executive function deficit disorder, much more than it is an attention disorder or a problem with hyperactivity. Since these executive abilities are biologically based, 
in the brain as a result of the neurological development of the brain and the genetics that are responsible for the brain's development, wiring, and functioning, then ADHD is largely a biologically based problem. That is why it has been reclassified as a neurodevelopmental disorder in our diagnostic manual. Very similar, for instance, to autism spectrum disorder in the sense that both chiefly arise as a consequence of biological factors, not social factors, not learning, not willful disobedience by the child, and certainly not bad parenting. This is a disability that is inherent to this particular child. <clears throat> Since it's biological, that leads to several implications. First, teachers need to view themselves more as shepherds guiding sheep along so that they can grow up to become successful and effective animals. But they are not engineers who get to design the children the way they want them to be by simply employing a variety of teaching methods in order to change the child's behavior, personality, and development. That simply isn't going to happen. So we have to accept the ADHD child for who and what they are and not try to turn them into what we wish them to be. They are not going to be like typical children. They are going to be like children about 30% younger in their executive abilities and self-control. So shepherds are incredibly important in the lives of raising sheep, are they not? They are responsible for choosing the pastures and making sure that the areas where the sheep are going to graze are nutritious, safe, and protected from the elements and from predators. They also want these environments to be stimulating so that the organisms, in this case the sheep, can in fact grow, learn, develop, and become much healthier adults than they would be had the shepherd not been present or had they chosen very poor uh, uh, pastures or very poor fields in which the sheep are to play. So if we extend this metaphor over to ADHD children, it means that your importance is in providing the kind of classroom in which these children can be nurtured, protected, can thrive, be stimulated, grow and learn in order to become the best children that they can. But it is certainly not to turn these sheep into pigs or goats or chickens. We don't have that capacity to engineer the children that we have, but we can help them to succeed. And we can do that by reducing the obstacles to their success that lead them to be impaired in these classrooms. So that's a very important idea. Your importance is as a shepherd, not as an architect or an engineer. Now, since the problems are biologically based, it also means that we can use biological agents in order to treat the underlying neurological and genetic problems that are occurring in the brain. Just as diabetes is a biological problem with the pancreas and its production of insulin in the body, and therefore it is acceptable to use biological agents like insulin to correct even temporarily, the problems that occur in diabetics. So too is it humane, rational, and acceptable to use biological agents with biologically caused neurodevelopmental problems like ADHD. And therefore, we have nothing to apologize for when we use medication for most ADHD children as part of the larger treatment package we want to design to make them more successful at school. So please consider whether or not this child's ADHD is of at least moderate or serious severity, in which case adding ADHD medications can be very helpful to improving their school performance and overall success. 
The executive view of ADHD also states that ADHD is a problem with doing what one knows. It is not a problem of knowledge or knowing what to do. ADHD children are not stupid. They are as intelligent, as knowledgeable as other children. What they cannot do is to employ that knowledge at critical places in the school environment where it would have been more effective for them to do so, and they would have been more successful had they done so. So ADHD is a performance disorder, not a knowledge disorder. Unlike intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder, which do involve skill deficits that require knowledge and skill training, ADHD is not like those disorders because ADHD largely arises from the frontal executive brain. The back part of the brain is where we learn knowledge, but that gets transferred to the front part of the brain where we can employ it in daily effective functioning. And it is the disconnection between these two areas in the brain and the variability in these connections that leads to ADHD children and teenagers not being able to do what they know. So a large part of treatment is helping the child with ADHD to show what they know at critical places in their school environment, what we call the point of performance, the where and the when of when that knowledge should have been employed for better effective functioning. And our job is to help them do that to show what they know. So while we will do some skill review with ADHD children, the majority of your time is spent rearranging these critical places in the school environment to further facilitate the child showing what they already know, rather than spending lots and lots of time trying to teach them what to do. Because that is information, that is knowledge, and ADHD is not information deficit disorder. It's a performance disorder. So yes, please review what the rules are, what the skills are, what children need to know. But having done that, you put most of your effort into rearranging the problem areas and the problem situations so that the ADHD child is more likely to do what they know. Those are very important ideas that come from the executive view of ADHD as we apply it to school situations. The executive view also says that ADHD is a problem with time and timing. ADHD interferes with the brain's ability to perceive and use time to guide behavior. So whenever assignments are given that have time intervals or deadlines, we will find that ADHD children are disabled by these because they can't sense the passage of time very accurately and they certainly cannot use it in guiding their behavior as to what they should be doing. So we say that the ADHD child is blind to time. Now how do we correct that? By putting time outside of the child's brain by giving them various devices that indicate the passage of time, such as digital clocks, or better, analog clocks, as I'll show you later in this presentation, that show you how much time has elapsed and how much time you have left, and therefore give the child that sense of the flow of time and what they should be doing with that time. So, Number one is that we're going to put clocks around the child, spring-loaded kitchen timers, counters that count backward, digital clocks, whatever you have available. The child needs to have that in front of them when you've given them a time interval as to how much time they have to get particular work done. In addition, it means that we have to reduce the delays to consequences. If ADHD children have to work and then wait to earn the consequences from their working, that is going to interfere with their functioning. We need to bring the consequences much closer to the behavior, to the work that they're doing, in order to make those rewards and consequences more effective at motivating them to behave well. 
Look at it this way. The more you delay the consequences and the further away the consequences are from the actions you're trying to reward, the less effective they are going to be. And while that's true of typical children, it is massively true with ADHD children. So keep the consequences close to the behavior that you're trying to manage. And you'll find that ADHD children thrive in environments that have this kind of increased accountability and reinforcement available to them. Now, longer term projects pose a significant problem for ADHD children, something like doing a book report, for instance, where the students in your class might be given a week or two to read a book and while they're reading to take notes and then to organize those notes into a report and proofread that and then turn in the final copy after which they're going to have to wait another few days or perhaps a week before they get their grades back that show how they did. Notice that we have put several weeks between the assignment and when it is due and another few days to a week between when we turn it in and when the child discovers how they did. That is a recipe for disaster for children with ADHD who cannot organize over time or sense time or use time in guiding their behavior. So the solution there is to break these longer term projects into much smaller bits or quotas so that the child has to do small steps in the project, small quotas of work every day with you for which they will receive immediate rewards for getting that work done. And then each day we take a step across the task and the delay and we have another brick in the bridge across the time interval, so to speak, while the child gets their work done. By breaking tasks down into small units and giving more frequent rewards for accomplishing those quotas or units, the ADHD child can get that work done but they can't get it done if you simply send them home with a book and the instructions to read it and produce a report in a week or two. That spells disaster. Also, this timing problem leads us to have to anticipate situations that are problems for them. And before we even start into that activity or situation, set up a plan, a treatment program, and share it with the child so that they can understand what is expected of them and they can show what they know. I'll say more about this, what we call transition planning, uh, in a moment. Other ideas from the executive functioning view that teachers need to accept and employ in their classes is that ADHD leads to a problem with internal or self-motivation. <clears throat> Excuse me. It means that they cannot motivate themselves to sustain their actions toward their work or tasks when there are no reinforcers around, no consequences or rewards for motivating them to do so. Look at it this way. They are dependent on the external environment to provide the consequences that reward and sustain their actions. And if the environment doesn't do that, they can't do it either. Whereas typical children, as they get older, develop a capacity to self-motivate. They don't need rewards around them all the time to stay on task, do their work, and persist toward their goals and assignments. They have internal motivation from their executive brain, and the ADHD child does not. So ADHD children must have external consequences. It is not an option or a choice. It is not as if you can say, why should we do that for this child with ADHD when we don't do that kind of reward program for typical children? The answer is obvious. These are not typical children. They are children with disabilities. And just as you would build a ramp into your school to allow a disabled child in a wheelchair to be able to effectively enter the school, we have to build ramps to help ADHD children succeed in that school. And one of those artificial devices, like a wheelchair to a disabled child, are these external artificial reward programs 
such as tokens and points. So we have to think about using external, tangible, more powerful consequences to make it what we call a win-win. They earn the consequences and the rewards. That's a win for them for getting their work done. And it's a win for us because the work got done and we did our job as educators. But you have to look at it from both sides. It isn't just about you and getting the work done. It's about what do I need to do to motivate them to stay on task and complete their assignments. ADHD children, because of their timing and motivation problems, need much more frequent feedback from people who supervise them as to how they're doing. So frequent praise, approval, redirection, instruction, and rewards all have to be given much more often, much more quickly and frequently than we do with other children if we are to keep them motivated and working. Occasionally, the ADHD child will need to be punished or disciplined for misbehavior. But when that happens, we must make sure that there are adequate rewards in that situation for performing the right behavior, for encouraging them to do the correct action. And then when we discipline them, such as removing them from the classroom and putting them in timeout, or taking away tokens from them as punishment for misbehavior, then that punishment will succeed. But punishment does not work if there is not adequate reinforcement or rewards in the environment to encourage and sustain the alternative correct behaviors that we expect that child to show. Otherwise, you will just wind up punishing a lot and it will be completely ineffective. You will need to change the rewards you're using for these children more often. Just as when we go to restaurants, the restaurant changes its menu in order to keep it interesting and to keep you coming back. We too, as teachers, must change the classroom rewards periodically for these children as they get bored or satiated with them. And then we have to come up with new ideas to help motivate them. These children can, in fact, tell you what they might be interested in to give you ideas of what rewards or playthings would be good to use. But overall, what we're discussing here throughout all these principles is the need for increased accountability for children with ADHD for their actions. We have to make the consequences more frequent, more immediate, more salient, and right up beside the behavior that we're trying to change if in fact that behavior is going to change. And if you can't do this, then please transfer the child to someone else who is willing to do it. Because if you don't do these things, this child is not going to get better and you're going to be incredibly frustrated as their educator. Other principles that we have to think of is that working memory isn't working. Working memory is where we hold information in mind that is guiding our behavior toward a task or a goal. It's the rules, the instructions, the assignments, the steps that we have to follow to complete that assignment. It's all of that being held in mind and guiding behavior. It's exactly like a GPS in your car that you use to get to destinations where you've never been before. The GPS is going to activate images in the form of maps and instructions in the form of language and rules and guide you over time to the destination. That is exactly what working memory is doing in the brain. But working memory is very defective in people with ADHD. And the way we solve that is by not relying on internal representations like working memory to guide behavior. That means that we have to put instructions outside the child and we have to list the steps that the child is to follow in that activity or task and to put them in front of the child on physical formats. 
Another way of thinking of it technologically is we have to offload the contents of working memory onto other external storage devices like pieces of paper, like cards and assignments and cues and sticky notes and other things that we put in the visual field around the child to help them remember what they're doing, what the steps are, and even what they're going to earn for getting it done. Now, this isn't going to be solved by constantly talking at the child and reminding and nagging and yelling and otherwise just continuing to spew information. As I said, this is not information deficit disorder. And the more you talk, the more you lose. Because by talking, you're asking them to hold more information in mind. Instead, write it down, put it in front of them, have it there where they're working so that they can refer, refer to it periodically to know how to act and what to do there. So the phrase we use in English is to externalize mental information, which means to put it in external form around the individual to better guide their behavior and not to talk so much. And then while we're working with them to periodically go around and touch them affectionately on the hand or on the shoulder and give them occasional rewards or praise or approval or maybe redirection, but keep it short, keep it brief, touch more, talk less, externalize information and put it around them while they're working to help guide their behavior. Now, certain kinds of mental information are not easily held in mind and manipulated by ADHD children. They can't do mental problem solving the way other children can. That's another executive deficit, is the ability to manipulate information we're holding in mind in order to come up with various options or ways of doing something. It's what we do when we engage in problem solving or when we plan out what we need to do to accomplish a goal. We're holding lots of bits of information in our mind and we're moving it around and taking it apart and recombining it to come up with various clever ways to hopefully get around the problem and solve it and get to our goals successfully. And the child with ADHD cannot do this. They cannot hold information in mind the way other children can. So it means that we have to take the pieces of information involved in the problem and the task and in some way put physical things around them to help facilitate problem solving. Take the problem apart, put it in their hands, externalize the problem so that they can manipulate it manually while they're trying to solve it mentally. A good example is that when they have simple arithmetic problems to do, we can give them physical objects like marbles or dried beans or tokens or checkers or anything that you have available that they can use and stack and count and subtract and manipulate with their hands, very much like you would do with an ancient abacus that was used for bookkeeping and accounting purposes. Those are the kinds of things that you need to do to help them with their problem solving. So again, by viewing ADHD as an executive disorder, these principles come from the executive theory of ADHD. And they are principles that tell us exactly what we have to do to try to compensate for these executive deficits in the children and teens with ADHD that are in our classrooms. So I hope that you find them useful because whenever you're in doubt, these are the ideas that you come back to time and again as to what do I need to do to help this child with these executive problems. Now, two final principles that come out of the executive view of ADHD is that self-awareness is deficient in this disorder. They are not attending to themselves and what they're doing and monitoring their actions as well as other people do for their age. As a result, they often don't know that they're drifting into trouble, don't always know that they're not getting their work done within the time interval that you have said, and don't always know how they come across to others in the, what they say and the way they act. So we have to try to find ways to improve their attention to themselves. One way of doing that is through video self-modeling. 
periodically take out your smartphone, which has a camera in it, which can record video, and from time to time record the ADHD child for a few minutes while they're working or interacting with other children or in a situation where they normally have a problem. And then what you can do later is to show them the video and talk with them about what they did right, what they did wrong. They love seeing themselves in these little movies, and they're great ways for instructing them and making them more aware of what they did, what was good, what was not so good, and what they could have done instead. So rely on the smart technology you have around you, particularly your cell phones, in order to use it to promote self-awareness. Other things you can do is to simply stop and ask them from time to time, randomly, unexpectedly. Ask them, what were you just doing? How did you do that? Did you get it done right? How did you get along with those children? Just simply ask them to stop and report. All you're interested in is encouraging them to be aware of themselves and what they do in situations. For really young children, such as children five to seven years of age or even younger, we have sometimes used a one-word cue to tell the child to stop and look at themselves and what they're doing. And the word we use is turtle because we want them to act like little turtles. We want them to stop as if they were a turtle that has been surprised by something in the environment. And we want them to look around like a turtle does when it pulls its head in its shell and peeks out and looks at the environment and what is going on. And then we want them to, unlike a turtle, ask themselves, what were you supposed to be doing? Where are you supposed to be? And then they can come out of their shell, answer the question, and be more aware of what they were doing. So periodically throughout the day with young children, simply stop and use the word turtle. Of course, you've had to teach them what that means and that you're going to be asking them to pull in their arms and their legs by their side, look slowly around the situation, and then report on what they were doing and if it's what they were supposed to be doing, and then get on with it with what they're doing. With older students, you can even use nonverbal cues. With some students, we've even put little eyes and ears on popsicle sticks, or what you might think of as those flat wooden tongue depressors that physicians use to examine your mouth. You can glue little googly eyes or ears or what have you, and all you have to do is lift the popsicle stick and wave it, and then put it down. And when the child sees that, they know exactly what you are encouraging them to do. Stop, monitor, report, and get on with the right things you're supposed to be doing. With even older students, you can get rid of the tongue depressor and you can simply walk around with a pen or a paper clip and be using it to simply clean your fingernails while you teach. But as you pass by the ADHD student's desk, you might drop it. That teen, and only that teen, knows that that was no accident, that that dropping of the pen or of the paperclip is a cue to them to stop, be aware, self-monitor, and then check to see if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So no one in the, else in the room need know that what looked like a mistake or an accident was in fact a nonverbal cue to self-monitor. So there are various ways of encouraging self-awareness. Another one is through a daily report card, which I'm going to show you in just a few moments. The last principle that comes out of viewing ADHD as an executive deficit is that they do not have the emotional control that other children have. One of the executive functions is emotional self-regulation. They don't have it so that they respond very impulsively with their emotions when they're provoked. And when strong emotions come out, they find it very difficult to regain control as quickly as other students do. Uh, and therefore, they may remain emotional longer and their emotions may be stronger than that of other children. So we have yet to find very effective ways of helping them with this other than through the use of ADHD medications, which do vastly improve emotional self-control with them.
But there are a few things you can do that I've already suggested as part of self-awareness. One is to video self-model, that is to video record them on your smartphone when they are behaving well and under control and keeping their emotions very positive. And you can review that with them periodically and reward and encourage them to keep doing this kind of behavior. The other thing you can do when they do become upset and very emotional is to record that temper outburst or upset and then go over that with them when they've calmed down to show them what they did wrong. Sometimes I even tell them when I'm recording it that we're going to text message or email this to someone who's important to them, such as one of their parents or perhaps an aunt, an uncle or a grandparent with whom they are very close. And we're going to send them this little video showing how upset they were. Well, of course, they don't want that. They don't want to be embarrassed by, their, uh, uh, by these videos with their relatives. Uh, and so it encourages them to show even more willpower and self-restraint, knowing that they could be videotaped when they get upset. Now, you have to think about that before you do it, because sometimes ADHD children have mood disorders such as bipolar disorder, uh, which they cannot control very well and which leads them to become very emotional and then they become irrational. And videotaping that isn't going to change that. But the general little tantrums and defiance and refusals to obey and upsets of daily life can be recorded. And by recording them and reviewing them with the child, we might be able to help them get more control. It also helps to have in your classroom a quiet location where when a child is upset, they can remove themselves to that location to buy some time and regain emotional control. And all we have to say to them when they're upset is, do you need a minute? Would you like to go over to the quiet corner? And many children will say yes, and they will go over and stop crying and calm down. And they know that they can come back as soon as they're done. And we'll talk about what happened. And then we'll reward them for using the quiet corner for calming down. We call these chill out or quiet locations. Now, some children may benefit from social skills training, though we have not found social skills training to be very useful in helping ADHD children, either with social skills or with emotional control.